because there's part of today's session, which is a, a new business tool that I've created. It's a new strate strategic framework, canvas or diagram to help people to have a real world approach to community building for that for their marketing. Um, it's also a bit of a plug in to the uh, business model canvas. So people who are aware of the business model canvas will know about the customer relationships box. So everything that we're talking about today mostly fits in that box. It's the relationship between the value that um, different businesses um, create and reaching out to their customers and communicating with their customers. So um, I wanted to just tell the story as well that um, part of this session um, has been tested in the real world. So there's a, there's a big part that's also about how you monetize communities. So I started talking to different businesses about that a couple of years ago. So we'll have that business tool alongside the community building tool. So by the end of today, you will have had a new definition potentially for, for what is a community. We'll have covered the monetizing community and you'll get some of these new tools and tips for building community. Um, as we found out with the poll, quite a few people either call their customers their community, around a third of the people on the call. Um, and it's become very popular um, for people to have the post community manager. So in the marketing world, there's a whole load of social media people and marketing people whose job title is a uh, community manager. So it's becoming quite a popular thing. And one of the reasons why it is popular is because um, when you have an online business, there has to be a reason for your customer to come and visit your website. There has to be a reason for them to, uh, to come to you. So they have to care about your brand and they have to feel that the brand cares about them. So it's becoming increasingly important um, for people to feel part of the, a, a belonging to the brand um, for them to engage and, and purchase uh, from your business, especially if it's an online business. So a couple of years ago, I, I did this presentation, which was all about monetizing communities. It was kind of five tips to build and monetize your community. And the tool in blue has become um, a, a really important part of my toolkit when talking to business owners. And I've worked with over 70 um, uh, small to medium enterprises over the last um, three years. And I've been sharing this tool with a lot of them. And it's in those business support sessions, it has actually been really valuable. So I'm just going to take you through um, uh, what this diagram does so that you're going to be able to use it for yourselves. So in one way, it's a very simple chart with two axes. And we have the, um, the on the left hand axis, we have many to few. So lots of people, content that's facing a lot of people to content that's facing a few people. And on the other axis, we have content that's either pre-written or pre-recorded on the left. And on the right, we have live um, content. So th the trend here is, and the observation here is, that when there are a few people or when content is live, you can charge more money. So this is a way to monetize your following. And the trick here and, and the big breakthrough from this from this slide is it shows you how you can charge six hundred pounds for 30 minutes. So the answer to that question of um, uh, charging six hundred pounds for 30 minutes is you have, for example, a six week course where everybody's getting an email to their mailbox every day. Most of the content that they're being provided with on this course will be pre-recorded webinars um, and, uh, and, and pre-prepared uh, guides and tips that are being sent through to them. 
but there's a small element of this VIP one-to-one -one, um, consultancy. So they maybe get over a six week period of time, they might get two 15 minute slots with the, the expert influencer who is, um, you know, who, who people are following in the community. The other things in there are create a package where the whole feels more valuable than the sum of its parts. So the whole package together, people will go, well, this is an amazing thing. It lasts for six weeks. I'm getting all this information. I'm going to go on weekly webinars. I can take part in a you know weekly peer support group. And I also get some consultancy. It's too good to be true. It's amazing. I'm definitely going to pay £600 for this six-week course. But when you then break it down from a commercial angle, when someone has run this um, a couple of times, it really is a good license to print money because you're actually charging for mostly pre-recorded content. So this has been very useful in talking to people and to business owners about why you should start a community and you know some of the benefits of it. But there was something for me that was niggling because I knew that a following isn't the same as a, a community. And that's what we're gonna to go on and, and talk about. So it was for the last two years, it's been niggling, out and I've been, it's been hard to put my finger on it around why should brands and influencers need a community and why, why should that be a genuine community rather than simply a large number of followers or a large audience or large customer segments. And, and that's the breakthrough that I'm, I'm sharing with you today. So also over the last two years um, um, on something called the Help to Grow course, which is um, the government's flagship course for leadership and management, and which I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on the authoring team for, we've been sharing with um, groups of business leaders this case study of Gymshark. So Gymshark, from having done Help to Grow, I, I, I'll know that a third of you will have probably heard of Gymshark. They provide fitness conditioning clothing. And then another, um, uh, you know, two thirds of you may be less familiar with the brand. So it's it's gym clothing. But the really interesting thing about Gymshark is it's a unicorn. So it's gone from it's a startup that's gone from a zero turnover to a, a one one billion pound turnover. And one of the main reasons why Gymshark has grown is because they genuinely care about their customer. They welcome their customer into their community. They, they actually call it their family and they help their customer to improve their fitness conditioning. So they don't simply sell clothes. They are helping people with their fitness conditioning and they do that in a range of ways. And one of those ways, and which is something that they use from early on, from 2013, is they invited their um, YouTube heroes to join them on their trade stand at the Body Power Expo at the NEC in 2013. And it was very natural for them to, to invite these uh, bodybuilding athletes to stand at the front of their stall and show people how to work out. So while that came naturally to them, it was revolutionary in, in that um, trade show. Most people had all their stock out front, whereas Gymshark had how to look good in the gym and how to uh, improve their conditioning at the front of their stall. And we would now call that an influencer strategy and now with hindsight, we, we would call Gymshark a community business model because they welcome people into their fitness conditioning community. And I've been over the last couple of years, I've been sharing with groups of business leaders. So typically we have, um, you know, 10 to 30 business leaders in the room. And on around 10 occasions, I've shared with people that Walker's Crisps, also want to develop a community. So Walker's Crisps, their community 
is around the joyful moments of eating crisps. So I've asked the business leaders in the room, can people care about eating crisps as much as they might be passionate about fitness conditioning and, and looking good in the gym? Is it possible to create a community around this? Is it a site of passion that people, you know, really enjoy these joyful moments? And there's always a bit of cynicism in the room, but there's always one or two people that go, oh my goodness, I love crisps. Crisps are my life. And, um, you know, some of the best moments in my lives, uh, my life is, is around crisps. And one person gave the example of they went out on a Friday night with their daughter and they they went out. They, they chose what film to watch and they chose what flavor of crisps to have. And, and that was their special me time together. So the interesting thing here is that even though um, Walker's Crisps having a community engagement manager and um, having a community strategy might seem like a bit of a bolt on that doesn't really work. There is actually a potential for them to improve customer engagement and customer generated con uh, content. So you may have seen that they've had a couple of campaigns in line with this strategy. So earlier in the year, around February, they had a Valentine's campaign, which was the £100,000 award for a heart-shaped crisp. And then they also had a big campaign about should you have the crisps inside your sandwich or on the side next to your sandwich. So that is an execution of their community strategy. But the big question is, is it real community? And of course, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So it's definitely great user generated content. It's definitely great um, involvement with the customer into the campaign. But is it community? So what is community? So we're, we're going to go through now some slides on what is community. And then we're going to go through some tools and tips for building community. And we're going to use a case study of a small Leicestershire organization to kind of explain all of this. So first of all, definition of a community. A community is a group of connected people who are associating with each other. So they're collaborating with each other around some sort of goal or shared interest. But what I'd like you to do here is I'd like you to swap the word thick network for community. So when, especially when you're speaking to business owners about their customer community, swap out the word community and replace it with the word thick network. And that's because the word community means too many things to too many people. What it should mean in this context is a thick network. And by thick network, we mean that the people in this community are connected to each other and they are associating with each other on all sorts of different um, projects and in different ways. So there's not a single line of communication. Their communication between other members of the uh, community is, is, is multiple. So communication is going in all sorts of directions. And when it's a brand community, we simply have the brand as a member of the community and a supporter and an enabler of the community. So that's that's one of the definitions of community I want to share with you today. And I also want to share this one. So I want you to move from a definition of community which is out there to a definition of community that is in here. And the example that I'm going to give is the NHS. So when the NHS talk about community nursing, they just mean everybody not in the hospital. So community nursing refers to health visitors, community nurses and, and schools nurses. So it's it's everybody having um, health care outside of the hospital. And then similarly, that that 
definition of community is used all the time and, and people just mean everybody out there. When a brand uses this definition, they're just talking about all our customers. And if it's a sophisticated brand with amazing integrated data, you know, the type of service that Annika provides, they might have a wonderful understanding of their customer segments and they might have tailored content to all those different customers. But that is content that's going mostly in one direction to those different customer segments um, uh, rather than the thick network where the communication is going in different directions. When we use the in here definition, we say community isn't a place, it's actually the relationships between a set of people. And um, that's really important. And we've just got one more slide here, which is which is really useful for talking about this in here definition. So when we have an in here definition of community, we're saying that there'll be multiple goals and projects that are shared between people, multi-directional uh, communication, multiple and shared values and beliefs. We can also bring in another characteristic here, another uh, dynamic, which is something called Dunbar's number. And Dunbar's number says that we have five close friends, uh, which are like our, our family, our kin. Then we have 15 good friends. And then we have 150 people who are acquaintances. And it's saying from an ethnographic academic research point of view, that the brain is wired for people to live in villages and that we've got a, a head and a neural network and a capacity for knowing 150 people. But we can't know more than 150 people. So it's really important when a brand sets up a community that that community Sometimes if, if, if we're using the, the, the marketing, if we've got the marketing hat on, we want as many customers as possible and, and as many people participating as possible. But actually, for participation to be meaningful, it does actually have to be smaller because people have to be able to know each other, connect with each other and associate with each other. Otherwise, it's not really a community. And going back to that Gymshark example, that group of um, that group of gym shark athletes is not massive. It's around you know 10, 10 to twenty athletes. Uh, they do have talent scouts for these people, and they are a bit like brand ambassadors. But they genuinely collaborate with the brand. Many of them have um, uh, not only shared fitness conditioning tips. Um, uh, uh, as brand ambassadors, but they've also created new products, new new clothing, uh, new functions of the clothing. Um, so um, if it's small and people are genuinely collaborating with you, that's meaningful. If it's a massive, large community, it then no longer becomes a community. So a really good test for this is um, if you put the word community in front of the street, or, or road that you live on. And then you say to yourself, is this a real community? So for me, it's the, um, I would say, um, is there an Empress Road community? And if there was an Empress Road community, then, then it would be five to 10 people on that road would know each other and be collaborating with each other and, um, and, uh, uh, and be part of each other's lives. Well, that, that, that really doesn't exist. When you use the out there definition, you start to talk about um, the Hindu community or the gay community or the BAME community. Well, it's not actually, you're not actually meaning the word community. You're just meaning group of large group of people or, or large neighborhood. And those people don't all know each other and they aren't connected with each other and they aren't working on shared goals. So if you use the thick network definition, all of those typical applications of the word community, a lot of them, they just don't work. So for me, there is no such thing as the Empress Road community. 
here's a nice slide that just outlines different types of brand communities. So this comes from, um, I've, I've updated this diagram a bit, so it's a little bit more UK specific, but this comes from a book and an approach by Carrie Melissa Jones called Building Brand Communities. So we've got here um, a number of different types of communities and, and in her book, she, she talks about um, fan communities, enthusiast communities and uh, employee communities. So there's, there's, there's lots of different communities. Some communities like um, Google do a, a collaborator community where they um, bring in a set of people who are experts who, who help develop Google products. Um, Harley Davidson um, has a Harley Owners Club. Um, so they are enthusiasts. And Lady Gaga has um, a, a Little Monsters community of fans. And we've, we've spoken about Gymshark as well. So there's a, a, a wide range of different types of brand community. The example that I want to use when I share these, these tools that I'm next going to come up with, the, the, the case study that I'm going to use for all of these comes from a local garden centre in Leicestershire. So what I did to choose the case study for today is I googled our values um, in, in, in exclamation mark, uh, in oh, quotation marks, and uh and and for Leicestershire and it was actually really surprising because you know when you, once you enter your search into Google Google's job is to make you happy and I was expecting there to be a large number of businesses with websites where they talk about their values on their websites Actually, what I found was mostly it was local authorities and public bodies that had the, um, the Our Values section on their website. But one of the ones that did come up, with, which was a nice SME, um, small organization, was a, a gardening center called The Grange. And they have this page. Um, and I'm sorry that the, the text might be small for some of you. Um, but but this is how they presented their values on their page. And I've, I've highlighted the, the kind of key features of their values. Um, so I haven't spoken to the Grange. I, I don't know the Grange. It might be that someone's on the call that has either been there and we might even have the content manager uh, person on the call who looks after the Grange. So so um, if, if if you are, please do join in with the chat. The interesting thing is how they present their values. It, it's really they're saying, what do we really care about? And they're saying we're a family business and we are a green company. And um, they're, they're saying we're very well known for our huge warm scones. So I don't think scones actually is a value. And they haven't really set this out as a, a normally, you know, in your business plan, when you're setting out your vision and values. It wouldn't be set out like this. So this suggests that this family business may not have gone through a kind of strategic planning process whereby they have had a visioning session and, and identified their vision and values. But they do know that they have great customer service and that they're a family business and, and a green company. But actually, that, uh, you know, having great customer service probably is just an expectation having warm scones is part of their product offering um the two things that are values here is that they are a green company and that they are a um, family business but from a business model perspective what you would expect from a, a business that services gardeners that one of their values would be a love of gardening. And you would expect that um, a love of gardening would be um, absolutely key to, to, to what they do and what they celebrate in their business. So there's a lot of scope here to talk about um, some how, how having a community around this passion of people loving their gardens wanting to spend time in their gardens, 
wanting to be with their family in the gardens, wanting to bring friends into their gardens, being able to get more healthy physically by gardening and, and you know, being in their green gym um, by um, improving their mental health through getting soil on their fingers, having a seed in the ground, nurturing growth. It's actually, gardening is actually a really elemental human area and there's an there's an awful lot that could be explored through a love of gardening to build a community for this garden center and I, and I can see that that we've got Kamala saying she's 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 been um they probably do have as a family business they probably do have a really good understanding of their customers. They will know what their customers buy. They will know their ideal type of customer. They will know the types of customer that spends a lot of money. If they have a loyalty card scheme of some kind, which they're quite likely to have, they will probably have lists of their customers. So if they were going to create a community of, of, of gardeners. So again, applying Dunbar's number, not turning everybody um, who are their customers into their community, but simply associating with a small group of their customers. It would be possible for them to invite their special customers into the garden center at a particular time for a gardening club. And they could follow through on a love of gardening by giving those special customers VIP experiences, which could be, you know, if they have a nursery, for example, it could be a tour of a nursery or a talk from the nursery manager. They could definitely have the scones, you know, so if they came in for a session, for a, 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 a meetup, they could definitely have the free afternoon tea with a scone. Now, quite a few people on the call will be marketing people and content managers and content creators and i would ask you here if you were sat with this gardening club and these people were talking about what issues are they facing in the garden at the moment what have they done in their garden recently um uh, and and just sharing their gardening tips with each other um if you were listening in on that conversation as a content manager, that would be gold dust because this is very similar to a focus group. And it's slightly better than a focus group because that for a qualitative market researcher, when they're doing a focus group, the gold standard for the best information provided is unprompted information, information that comes without the interviewer having to ask a question. So we can see that if this garden center did have a gardening club looking after this um, small group of gardeners, it would be gold dust. The insights they get, they would have months and months of content from each meeting. So if they had a monthly meetup, the person doing the content would have hundreds of things to mention. And it could be that to join the club, this is a brand community, a community owned by the garden center. When they join this community, they understand that the, the sessions will be recorded, that their data will be used, um, that, the, that it is being supported and financed by the garden center, but that they are the garden center in return is absolutely committed to enabling this group of people to associate around their own goals, projects, and interests. So the brand doesn't direct. So this is very different to a networking event, for example. Often with a networking event, a whole load of people come along and they just get talked to and then they leave. You know, they get three talks, keynote speaker, and leave. That's not involvement. And it doesn't celebrate the talent in the room. It doesn't, it's not meaningful and it's not enjoyable. And you go away from a lot of networking events feeling completely ignored. There's an opportunity here for these people to leave feeling a real connection with the brand and having shared 
high quality information with that brand that then improves their brand qualities, that then gives insights into um, trends, uh, new products. Um, these gardeners might have a new idea for um, I buy my seed potatoes this time of the year and I would like the seed potatoes to be presented in this way um, or in this kind of pack so I can take it straight home. So the gardeners on the call will know that um, when you buy your seed potatoes in January, you then you then start a, a process called chitting, where um, probably the wrong word to mention on, on a call uh, if people misheard me. Um, but the, the potatoes start to root and that's something that you do. But you don't also you don't want those potatoes to dry out and all sorts of things. So if you truly listen to your customers and all businesses should listen to their customers. And if this garden center did this, they would truly, truly listen to their customers. They wouldn't just listen to them as they go through the till. They wouldn't simply be reliant on the data of the sales made through the till. They would actually pick up on the most amazing business insights into the cust their customer's world and how they can make that customer happy, including new trends, new opportunities, new products. And this, this garden center might find out such useful information that they might then get um, partnerships with people for new product development. They might change the layout of the store. They might start to change their offering around their loyalty card. There's so, so many things that could come out of a garden center creating a small group of people to come in and participate in a community so you can see that I'm, I'm you know i'm quite excited and passionate about this and hopefully that's that's given you a flavor of what could come out of um a community so here is my beautiful special new tool which allows you as um uh, so, some of you are kind of community people some of you are content management people some of you are marketing people this tool allows you to align the values and purpose of the company with the lives and the, the, the usage that people have for things and what, what, what they use in this scenario, what they actually use their garden for. So instead of ignoring their gardens and their lives, this is bringing in the customer into the business model having a much closer relationship with them. And I use this term on the right hand side, their glorious life. So you are exploring and understanding the customer's glorious life, what they use the brand, what it means to them, what they, what they use it for. <coughs> Excuse me. On the other side, on the left hand side of the canvas, you have got the values and the purpose of the company and you are um, creating a community which is the alignment between what the business cares about and what the customer cares about and you are giving the opportunity to the business to follow through on what it cares about and show better what it cares about which i believe acts as a magnet especially for an online brand it it amplifies the magnetic quality of the brand pulling customers towards you. So what we have with the community here is where we are attracting people to join in. So in this case, the garden center um, with this, can I, you might be able to see my mouse there on, on the screen. We are, we are inviting the customer in to care about um, a shared value of some kind. And, um, and then they are forming a group and then we are giving them an opportunity of having repeated occasions where they meet each other and associate with each other to build their community. So at first we have to kind of attract them in potentially with some emotional values. We need to replicate the principles of how people form relationships, essentially where, 
we're helping people form relationships. So we have to give them the fortuity and the occasion uh, to keep meeting, to have repeated occasions where they will be, in this case, a group of gardeners swapping tips with each other, giving each other advice, sharing information and enjoying talking about their garden. They might spend half of their time talking about Gardener's World and the other half of their time talking about their pets and their family. It, it, you know, it, it, they will start to really know each other. We need to create foundational commonality. So we need to be able to create a safe space where they are sharing their views and beliefs and they are starting to form some, some shared values. And we are creating an opportunity for reciprocity. So this is where people start to help each other out. And once one person helps another person, it creates an obligation and that creates social capital. So we are building with these repeated occasions of meeting over time. We are developing social capital within this community. So in many ways, this is a bit like um, a dating agency or matchmaking agency or a dinner party host who is bringing together a group of people and encouraging them to get to know each other. And, we, you know, you can't force people to have a relationship or to belong, but you can create fertile conditions for that to happen. And there isn't a magic formula for creating relationships between people and creating relationships between brands, but this is a very useful structure for giving that good chances and creating a nurturing environment that uh, attracts people into a community, maintains activity, and uh, creates those relationships. Um, I probably need to finish in the next three to you know ten minutes um, so that we can take some questions in the chat. But I just wanted to share one more tool with you, and with this diagram, we're looking at the different elements of what it means to be a human being. And I'm going to switch case study here just for a minute um, to show you what it might be like with some of your customers. And we will use the garden one as well. So, so um, imagine that you are looking after a brand that sells garage doors. So the part of the human experience that they're part of mostly will be the built environment. And that will be the area which that brand fits most with. And then you're just wanting to create for a brand, for example, around garage doors, you would want to find really, it's not the, it's not really probably about the doors, but it is in the similar way of the garden, it's what they do in their garage. What does somebody who absolutely loves their garage want to get out of it? And a really good question for, for brand owners to ask is, what market segment most benefits from my brand value. So imagine a whole load of enthusiasts who love their cars and love their garages or love their garages because they're tinkering in it. So yes, mostly um, they fit into this box, which is the built environment. But then you ask the brand owner, choose another segment which is like the adjacent segment, the, the thing that is most similar to the built environment, and then choose a wild card segment. So you, you can't say to a garage door um, uh, supply and fit company, you can't say um, create a community that covers all aspects of, of human behavior and human activity straight away. But you can start to make their brand more human and help them create a, a, a more human community by moving it into an adjacent one and into a, a and, and, and maybe one that also um, has, um, th that tests them to stretch themselves a bit further. So if, if you were um, creating a brand around the garage doors, the, the adjacent one might be that people are using their garage 
it might be for um, uh, reasons to make money. They might actually be tinkering to, to, to sell things and make money, or they might be doing it purely for entertainment. So entertainment might be the next one. But then what is the next one along that, that they really care about? Probably knowledge. What is the one that they really don't do in there? Something that would be the wild card and you, you come up with something like eating. So probably they are not meeting up in each. Uh, there's probably not a community of, um, of, of garage fans and they're probably not going round to each other's houses to, to meet up and, and eat in their garages. But if there was a community around garage fans, there has to be more to it than just garage doors. There can't be just one shared interest. There has to be multiple shared interests. And we need to um, encourage our brands to become more human and uh, to create more um, points of activity uh, which enable people to become connected to the brand through the forming of these communities. So you can use these tools to help businesses create a community strategy. Um, you can help them explore their vision and values, and then you can help challenge them to explore their customer's glorious life. And they, they may well have customer segmentation, they may well have customer personas, but you're encouraging them to see their customer in a more human way. You're then, once you've got your two sides, uh, uh, knowing what your customers want and knowing what your brand is all about, you're talking about building pathways um, to welcome people into your community and, and join the community, create excitement. And then you have these repeated, repeated meetings that build mutuality and reciprocity and they get to know each other and they create this thick network over time that creates belonging to the brand and brand equity. And it also provides the brand with amazing business intelligence into their, their customers. So I will be creating a course on this that can be delivered both to um, brand owners to help develop their community strategy, but I'll also be creating training courses for marketing people to understand how they can help businesses create their um, community strategy.